Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the Quantum event. It's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. I am Nadia, Nadia Benalal, the Managing Director of La French Tech Paris-Saclay, and we co-organize the event with the Lab Quantique. We would like to thank our sponsor, Total, la Mairie de Versailles et la Communauté d'Agglomération de Versailles Grand Parc, to give you the opportunity to follow the event directly and online. And if you have some question, don't hesitate to use the chat box on channel YouTube. I will ask directly the question to our speakers. So now we will start with Valérian Giez. Valérian Giez from La French Tech Paris-Saclay. Valérian, it's you. Thank you, Nadia. And good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present now French Tech Paris-Saclay. So actually, I have two hats. Um, one, as a co-founder or CEO of Candela, uh, we will have the opportunity to pitch after uh, with Nicolas Somaski. I'm very glad for this. And also, as a co-founder of French Tech paris uh, actually, the territory paris got, uh, uh, we, have this, we have this with the partners IBM, Total. Uh, in the ecosystem, we also have a lot of academic labs where, with, where is the best of the um, academic research in science, physics, biology, chemics, chemistry, in a lot, a lot of very interesting topics. Um, uh, we can also mention, of course, universities, uh, engineering, grand école, uh, typically French, where there is a pool of students which is unique in France. All these elements make paris Saclay a territory for deep tech, and this is why we are very glad to create French Tech paris Saclay. The purpose of French Tech Paris Saclay is to create a community, community of startups, for in order to accelerate the, the meetups between startups and uh, investors, and also big firms for collaborations, for contracts, for business. Um, and actually, the association French Tech Paris Saclay works very actively for the development of every member, startups, big firms partners like lawyers, banks, everything, and also for their growth on the territory of Paris-Saclay and abroad. Um, so here, not every speakers are startup from Paris-Saclay. Some are from Paris-Saclay, for example, startup Pascal from Institute Optique, startup uh, Candela from Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Um, also, all the startups are collaborating with actors from Paris-Saclay. This is very important. And also, if you are from abroad paris Saclay or from Paris, for other regions, from our abroad France, you're also very welcome to join, uh, join the, the territory, uh, set a lab here, and start collaborating with all the ecosystem. We are here to welcome you and to assist in your installation in paris Saclay and uh, in, in assist in your growth. Um, I'm very happy to have this event here in Versailles. Uh, we will, this is an opportunity to start with a very, with a field that I, I like a lot. It's strongly correlated with a digital world of tomorrow in five, 10 years, quantum computing, quantum technologies. Actually, I hope you will be convinced that this is not science fiction. Um, this is for real. And uh, I hope the speakers of today will show you that uh, there are real business use cases for today, for tomorrow, and for the next 10 years. So I'm very happy to, um, to have this event today in Versailles, and I, will, I would like to thank uh, Versailles Grand Park and the City Hall of Versailles for this beautiful place. Unfortunately, we can have a big audience here, so it's a, a digital, it's a digital event. But thank you very much for this place. I hope we will have opportunity to start again in a other context. Thank you. I will give, I will give the floor to Jean-Gabriel Boineau from the Lab Quantique. 
So hi everyone, thank you very much for uh, coming to this event uh, online. I'm Jean-Gabriel Buono, Vice President of the Lab Quantique. We're a not-profit association. We were funded uh, mostly one year ago and I'll give some visibility to all the researchers, academics, uh, corporates and startups that are developing initiatives in the field. So we were funded with, in a partnership with uh, Quant and the Accelerator Deep Tech Funder. I also work at uh, Quantum Nation, which is the first VC fund dedicated to quantum technologies. I will also speak during the roundtable around VC investment in the field. The Lab Quantique is a um, not profit uh, composed of roughly 1,200 members. We try to organize conferences uh, on a monthly basis to help people get some visibility. Uh, all our uh, uh, all our uh, contenu is uh, available on, the, on our website, Le Lab Quantique, and on our YouTube channel, where the conference is currently broadcast, um, qubits and other quantum computing technologies. Uh, thanks to Quantum Nation, we have also the opportunity to bring some startups that have developed really cutting-edge technologies and in field that concerns quantum computing. There is also the quantum sensing part and quantum communication. Um, well, thank you very much, Versailles, for uh, the city of Versailles, for uh, all the speakers today. I hope you'll enjoy this event and uh, see you after. Okay, now I will give the floor to Jérémy Hervé, the Director of Innovation of l'Établissement Public d'Aménagement de Paris-Saclay. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. My name is Jeremy, and I'm in charge of supporting foreign companies to set up their business in Paris-Saclay. And by business in Paris-Saclay, we're mostly talking about R&D activities. So I'll give you a brief introduction of the potential of Paris-Saclay for carrying out R&D activities. Uh, so Paris-Saclay is located southwest of Paris City Center. We're talking about the territory that is about twice the size of Paris City located 20 kilometers from the capital city and soon, uh, well, by 2026, will be connected to Paris City and all the international airport by a new uh, express train line 18 from Grand Paris Express network. So you'll be 25 minutes from Paris City Center. We were ranked in the top eight innovation hotspots in the world along with uh, Silicon Valley or Boston Cambridge uh, Biotech Campus in, in Boston. Uh, this year, we uh, have reached the first rank worldwide in mathematics in the Shanghai ranking with Université Paris-Saclay, 14th worldwide overall. Université Paris-Saclay is first university in France and in the European Union. So it's a great achievement for us. Uh, when we talk about Paris-Saclay academic forces, we mostly talk about two uh, groups or two federations of uh, engineering schools and the best universities in France. We're talking about 65,000 students, uh, three Nobel Prizes, 10 Fields Medals, and of course, many cross-disciplinary research teams with these 19 members composing the two uh, Université Paris-Saclay and Institut Polytechnique de Paris academic players. Of course, this makes us a very highly skilled talent pool. Um, the, the average in France for higher education degrees, 36% in Paris-Saclay, we have reached 48% and 41% of the most wanted French artificial intelligence engineers actually come from Paris-Saclay. So this is the place you should be to carry out R&D activities. This is where the talents are located. Of course, it's not only about the academic forces and scientific forces. We also gather 15% of French private R&D and the largest R&D campuses, private R&D campuses in France are located in Paris-Saclay. We're talking about five strategic industrial verticals, including uh, cybersecurity and defense, the future of mobility, health and biotechnology, uh, ICT-related technologies that include quantum technology and energy, climate, and environment, which we usually call clean technologies. For each of these industrial verticals, you can see that we have all the components necessary for innovation, the major international players, the game changers or startups, we have uh, all the innovative communities you can need. French Tech Paris Sacré gathers about 400 startups. We have also a club of innovation directors that gathers the, uh, the uh, innovation directors of French and international majors. Uh, we have an annual rendezvous called Paris Sacré Spring 
and it's a good opportunity for you to meet all these innovative communities on one single day. This uh, Paris Cycle Spring event will be held in May 2021 for its third edition. We have a specific Paris Cycle Startup platform for which I invite you to register, uh, paris-cycle-startup.com, and you will have access to more than 400 startups of Paris Cycle and also 38 uh, innovation places, including incubators. Thank you very much, and I will be very happy to give you more information later on if you have some time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, so now Thomas Bonour, the Economic Development Director of La Communauté d'Agglomération de Versailles Grand Parc. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Thomas Bonour. I'm in charge of public transportation, economic development, and urban planning and project for Versailles Urban Territory, which is about 300,000 inhabitants, uh, southwest Paris. First of all, on behalf of François de Mazière, Mayor of Versailles, I would like to welcome you and uh, to welcome you and uh, thank you for uh, joining us today for this uh, quantum computing event. Well, I'll try to be brief because I'm not a quantum computing expert and it's what you're looking for. So, but I just would like to share one thought with you um, about Versailles. You probably know Versailles for its castle and wonderful uh, landscape, but there is something else you should know. You should know that um, when Louis XIV built the castle, or at least made people build the castle for him, he led major innovation come to Versailles, especially in, in the field of water management. Nowadays, being part of Paris Cycle Cluster, we're still deeply involved in innovation, and this is part of our DNA. For the last six years, we've been developing a specific method to renew our relation with innovation. This is, this is based on partnership with companies that compose our um, amazing ecosystem here, that Jeremy has been presented. The deal with companies is very simple. We make sure that they can demonstrate their technologies, know-how, value proposition in the field, in real conditions. But we also expect them to help us to face the challenges um, that we have to tackle as a territory. Climate change, energy consumption, congestion, air quality, and at the same time, all the financial constraints um, that we are also facing at the same time. And we had great achievements, for example, with hydrogen buses, autonomous vehicles, air quality monitoring, and data mobility. So when it comes to quantum computing, preparing this, error or I don't, it's above my comprehension, really. But what I know, what I understood from my discussion with uh, Quantic Lab and Paris Sacle French Tech is that quantum computing could help us understand the flows. Because you have to understand that for a city, for a territory, we are used, or, or software is about managing stocks, assets, infrastructure, building, public space, roads. But everything is overloaded, overcrowded. We need now to understand the flows to have a better idea, a better understanding, to be able to predict, to anticipate, to decide, and to act. And as I understand it, quantum computing will help, help, help us achieve this. And I look forward to listen to the, all the discussion with time before I give the floor to quantum computing experts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. So now we will start with the first presentation. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you also for the invitation. So my name is Eric, and I will give you a brief overview of the possibility of quantum technology in terms of application and market. So, just a very brief introduction of your development. We are a consulting company 
more than 100 people based in Lyon, but also worldwide in North America, in Asia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and we are involved in market research, in photonic sensing, semiconductor and software, power and wireless. For each of these domains, we can provide custom survey and of the shelf reports. So all the information and analysis I will share with you today is extract from the quantum report we did early this year in terms of market forecast, technology tra technological trends, supply chains, and players. So when we talk about quantum, we consider three main applications. Computers, including real quantum computers and also quantum annulars. Sensors and atomic clocks and telecoms. Of course, today, the big excitement for this technology is clearly concerned with computers, and I will explain why. This is just a, ch a first overview of the quantum public investment worldwide. Actually, more than 16 billion US dollars has been invested worldwide for quantum technology. Why that? Because quantum technology will address secure communication and database management linked to national security. In Europe, for example, there is a one billion project, flagship project in quantum. And last week, the European Union proposed a new regulation to set up a budget of 8 billion euros to invest in next generation HPC, including quantum. If we consider private fundings, this is the chart pie that show over the two past year the amount of private funding for quantum technology. More than one billion US dollars have been invested mostly for quantum computing and the rest for quantum algorithm and cryptography. When we talk about quantum, we can consider two main things. First, we can consider qubit-based technology related to computing and also entanglement of photons, for example, for secure communications. But there are other applications of quantum technology, such as the one related to sensors, for example, gravimeters, atomic clock, or any kind of other sensors, such as quid sensors. And we have strong know-how in Europe for sensors based on quantum technology. This is just a sh first example. Quantum is currently getting out from the lab. It's no longer R&D, but we have entered the second phase where engineering is needed to turn quantum technology into product. This example of a French startup that has turned quantum development into a product. As you can see on the right, they, have, they are using quantum photonic to develop, ship, and commercialize a gravimeter can be used for all prospection, for example. This is a fully integrated a turnkey quantum gravimeters. Another example is for telecommunications. So it's a second example that shows that quantum can really be turned into a commercial product. In 20 years, IDQ, a Switzerland-based startup, has reduced its random key generator chip from shoebox size to a chip that could fit into a smartphone. And they currently announce a partnership with SK Telecom in Korea to announce the world's first 5G smartphone equipped with a quantum random number generator for ultra secure communications. It shows that even in the consumer field, quantum can be used. Actually, quantum is also a real market. So it's just also an example of the market value of quantum technology in the telecom field, which is currently a market of almost 70 million US dollars. Let's talk about quantum computers, which currently attract most of the investment of the VC and the financial community worldwide. There are different types of quantum computers. As you can see on this chart, we got many big names currently involved in the development of quantum computers. To make it simple, we can distinguish quantum annular, 
not real quantum computer, and real quantum computer can, can use qubit to make logical calculations. So you can see that, for example, Microsoft, Fujitsu, D-Wave are developing quantum annular, and that are used for new material development or aerospace research. On the bottom line, you can see companies like Microsoft, IBM, Google, many of them developing quantum computers based on different technology. The fact that today there is no fixed technology for quantum computers. We can use topological qubits, trap ion, quantum optics, spin qubits. Some of them advantages, the advantage, some of them are wafer scale, capability for mass manufacturing, all of them are different pro and con. But today it's very difficult to say which technology will be the winning one in the future. So that's why we still have a lot of R&D for quantum computers. As you can see on this lower map, over the past five years, there have been an acceleration of the development of quantum computers. On the vertical axis, this is the number of qubits, physical qubits, that are currently developed by this company. And you can see that since, let's say, 2015, the announcement from Intel, Google, IBM, D-Wave, Rigetti show that they are currently on the road to increase the number of qubits in their computer. It also shows that, as I explained previously, we are no longer doing fundamental, fundamental R&D for quantum computers, but real engineering work to turn quantum into commercial product. For example, two weeks ago, IBM has announced 1,000 qubit achievement in 2023. Another important part of quantum computer is called cryo stage. It's very important to have very cool environment just to prevent the quantum chips to be um, to be annoyed by noise, external noise. So it means that companies developing quantum technologies, quantum computer, need to have a very strong know-how to cryogenic cooling. It's very important technology along with the development of qubits. Application. There are very, very numerous applications for quantum computer. Can be consumer, data com, telecom, industrial application, automotive, aeronautics, material science, medical, finance, energy defense. Now there are a lot of development for autonomous car robotic vehicles. We need to know how to manage this fleet because there will be no driver, for example. This is where autonomous, uh, sorry, this is where quantum calculation can be used. Another example is aeronautics. Quantum technology, quantum computer can help develop lighter plates with new material that will be less energy hungry. Energy, as we told about that, also there is big challenge in the future for smart city and smart grid, smart energy optimization. This is also one application where quantum calculation can be used. And also, Last but not least is medical. There is ve very challenging modernization of protein, for example. The most powerful thing, for example, there is also a field where quantum computer can help. So as you can see on this chart, there's currently a full supply chain that's currently setting up for quantum technology. On the left side, you have this company developing hardware, it can be Company like Quandela doing single photon sources, Alice and Bob in Lyon. So there is startup, for example, big company, lar I would say larger company developing quantum computer like just as Rigetti, Fujitsu, Honeywell, Google, and so on. Company developing software layer because, as you can imagine, quantum computer need specific algorithm, specific languages. So you need to develop the own software. Services, you can use computer for very specific services and companies like Amazon, IBM are already put their quantum computer on the cloud so you can use them and do some training with quantum calculation. And at the very end 
of the supply chain that the user, such as Total, EDF, Volkswagen, Bayer, Airbus, or NASA, that will take benefit of quantum computers for new material research, um, spatial research, um, modulation of car fleet, and so on. So just a, a quick snapshot of the potential in, for the semiconductor company. So the value for quantum computer will be in the final system, not in the silicon. So I will go quick on that, but on this graph, you can see that in 2050, the number of silicon wafers for quantum computer will not be so big. I did a quick calculation, and my forecast is by 2050, 40,000 eight inch wafer will be processed for quantum chips. Not a lot, but again, the value will be not in the wafer, but the system and the software associated. And as you can see here, how we can modelize the market forecast for quantum computer. We take the HPC value. What is the value in terms of um, money we spend to rent one hour of HPC and how we can use that for a quantum computer? I would say, that for example, we consider, let's say, one hour HPC renting is 2,000 US dollars. Let's consider this price for a quantum computer can be much faster. And at the end, you can calculate the market value of quantum computing. You can see that I split this forecast in two. The orange part is the hardware. The yellow part is the software, the services. As you can see, services will represent most of the value of quantum computer forecast in the future. I believe there will be not 100 and 100,000 quantum, quantum computers worldwide, maybe a few hundred of them at the most. But it will be big value system. So maybe 20, 25 million US dollars each. But at the end, these quantum computers will allow much more value in terms of services and software. So, as a snapshot, you can see here the market forecast for quantum technology. So, you can see on the yellow part that quantum computers will attract most of the value of quantum technology of in the future. Orange part is for quantum cryptography. Before, because of 5G, for example, more and more bandwidth will be required in fiber optic network, but also more um, secure and cryptograph cryptography network is where quantum will play a role also. Quantum sensor, this is the blue part you can see on this graph that's already an uh, existing market estimated to around 400 million of US dollars. I'm quite optimistic that even for quantum sensor, there will be a market and I estimate that by 2030, the market for quantum sensor will exceed 500 million of US dollars. So this is just an example of many companies involved in quantum. As you can see on this map, there's not only big players, not only Google, Amazon, and so on. There's many opportunities for small startups. And specifically in France, there is a lot of interesting development, very exciting startups involved in France. So just to conclude, I will say that here again, we are entering the second quantum revolution when engineering is needed to develop future quantum systems. Quantum technology is not new, at least for cryptography and sensing, but for computer, it will be a real new disruption compared to traditional semiconductor supply chain. It's new physical principle, there is no more law, there is strong business opportunity for services, and has it has been shown by Amazon. The December 2019 announcement showed this trend. Quantum as a service is going to impose itself through the big player who will set up the anti-software and service ecosystem. But there is, of course, room for small companies involved in quantum, and they will find interesting opportunity. Quantum technology is also cryogenic technology, is also photonic technology, for sensors, there will be new challenge to lower the cost for large volume market. And 
quantum cryptography with a new opportunity in defense, bank, telecommunication, and there is also big opportunity in defense and scientific research for quantum computers. Thank you for your attention, and if you had any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we have uh, some questions. The first one, according to him, how Europe should uh, position for a quantum cloud? So how? How Europe oh. should position. OK. Um, OK. Europe is aware that quantum is critical technology. So there's the big flagship project of 1 billion euro over 10 years. And quantum is also part of other projects, such as the project for HPC. What we're missing in Europe, maybe compared to the US, is a full supply chain. In the US, there is a GAFAM, Facebook, and so on, that require new technology to answer the demand in bandwidth. So I think Europe should consider itself maybe to set up some kind of big quantum champion, such as, uh, such as Airbus, for example, in quantum technology. But I'm very confident that Europe is well aware of the challenge of quantum technology and they position themselves to answer this demand. We have more, one more question from the other speakers. Uh, he mentions a lot of uh, U.S. company. You mentioned a lot of U.S. company. What does he think about the Chinese strategy? Okay. So I'm pretty sure that there is a lot of development in quantum technology for China. I would say that maybe if we consider the number of qubits they have achieved so far, maybe they are a bit late compared to the U.S., uh, compared to IBM or Intel, we announced uh, maybe 5,200 qubits. But because they have a full supply chain also in terms of uh, big internet company, they are also mastering uh, semiconductor and photonic, so I'm pretty sure they are currently involved in quantum technology as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Okay. So now it's uh, Robert Rang from the IBM, and he will present the quantum advanced computing and application in IBM. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robert Wang, I'm a quantum ambassador and the Qiskit advocate at uh, IBM. Qiskit is the quantum computing programming tool at, uh, of uh, IBM. Uh, I did my PhD in Paris Sud University many years ago. Today it is Paris Saclay University. So I'm excited and happy to be here to present an overview of quantum computing at IBM. But before presenting quantum, I'd like to show you our collaboration with Paris Saclay University not yet on quantum, but on AI, quantum might achieve the same kind of things in this implementation was born with ADA. ADA stands for AI for Digital Automation. It is a four-year core innovation project. Uh, it will bring together IBM three French companies and the uh, University of Paris-Saclay in this core innovation center. We will have more than 300 software developers and we will create an IBM research unit in order to help companies to automate their industrial operations with AI. Now, back to quantum. These are the four items on the agenda I'd like to talk about. The hardware of IBM quantum computers, the software, our quantum network, our quantum ecosystem, and the road to quantum advantage. This famous picture taken at the first physics of computation 
conference co-organized by IBM and MIT in 1981 shows that IBM is a pioneer of quantum computing. There are several IBM Earths on the picture. The picture itself was taken by Charles Bennett. He is still working at IBM. He is a founder of quantum communication and quantum cryptography. The great physicist Richard Freeman is on the picture. I, on the hardware side, IBM quantum computer use super, con, super uh, contacting uh, qubit. They are set on the chip cooled to 50 millikelvin at the bottom of this kind of uh, machine, this kind of refrigerators. 50 millikelvin is called uh, the old space, 200 times colder than Today, we have 29 uh, stable quantum computers on our cloud. The most recent one has uh, 65 uh, qubits. The general public users have free access to a set of five and 40 qubit systems. More efficient quantum computers are for our dedicated clients. We also have a high performance emulator. For near term quantum computers, NISQ, if you want, increasing the number of physics qubits is not enough to improve the overall system performance because many other factors contribute to it. For example, the coherence time, the connectivity between qubit, various error rates, even software, I mean the optimization of quantum circuit, contribute to it. So IBM introduced the concept of quantum volume in 2017 to take all these factors into account. Quantum volume quantifies the largest random circuit of square shape that a given quantum computer successfully implements. It is a holistic metric to compare system, system performance and to evaluate uh, a, a technical advance. Of course, it is difficult or impossible to tell the whole story, the entire story of a system as complex as quantum computers is owning a single number metric. Even so, it is useful. It is quite useful. The technical definition of quantum volume is quite mathematic. To better understand it, we can use an uh, analogy. Consider you are exploring Paris. You want to explore all of the city. You want a tourist volume the size of Paris. If you only have one day, there's no way to explore all of the city. You don't get your desired tourist volume. However, if you have three days, maybe you could explore, visit all of the top spots of Paris and get your needed tourist volume. Now, what if you have more time, but you restrict the space to Paris? Yeah. There is no benefit to you because you have already explored Paris and you are visiting the same spots over and over again. Your tourist volume remains the same, the size of Paris. So having more time, it is smarter to extend the number of uh, uh, spots to visit, extend the space to visit. Now, suppose you still have three days, but you want to explore all of Paris, then explore Versailles, come here to explore. Again, your tourist volume remains the same, remains the set of Paris because three days are, are just uh, enough 
to explore Paris. We don't have time to come here to explore. So being better tourist, you increase at the same time the number of spots to visit and your time to make it. In this analogy, the number of spots to visit is the number of cubic cubic. Your time is the inverse of error rate. Essentially, C0 gets error rate. Your achieved, achieved tourist volume is quantum volume. Your desired tourist, tourist volume, which may be very big, can be seen somehow your effort space. This is the evolution of quantum volume since the beginning. It has doubled at least every year from the number four in 2017 to the number 64 in August this year. For some people, it makes them think of Moore's law for classical computers. On the software side, IBM launched quantum experience in, in 2016. It is the first and the largest online platform of quantum computing in the world. You can access a set of quantum computer through cloud. It is quantum computing on cloud. Open access for general public. Premium access for our clients. You can explore a graphic interface to learn the fundamentals of quantum computing to create and experiment your quantum circuit. It is a composer, like a music composer. You can, you can track and drop quantum gates from the top of the page onto qubit lines at the bottom of the page. It is your quantum circuit. You can also use an advanced programming tool, Qiskit. Qiskit stands for Quantum Information Science Kit. It is open source written in Python. You can download and uh, install it on your, at no cost on your laptop. Qiskit has um, four components. Each one has a special purpose. Deha provides the foundation of uh, Qiskit. It allows users to create the quantum uh, circuit. Air at the right is a high performance emulator for algorithm development that includes noise models. Ignis at the left provides tools for characterizing noise and mitigating errors. Aqua at top center provides a library of uh, quantum algorithm, algorithms and uh, components to build practical applications. Now, the third topic about our quantum network, our quantum ecosystem, Qiskit user community is the largest quantum computing community in the world since its launch. It is highly active. We organized many events around the globe. In New York, Madrid, uh, Tokyo, Johannesburg, so on. Since COVID-19, we have organized a series of video conferences, for example, a two-week uh, global uh, Kiskit summer school in July, of course, this year. And uh, there were 4,000 lecture attendees around the world. The day before yesterday, on Sunday, we have start a course, a quantum course. Uh, 5,000 people have logged in. IBM Quantum Network was uh, launched in December 2017. It is the biggest global quantum computing of professional network of uh, universities, uh, industrial leaders, 
research labs, and the startups. Today, there are 132 members in the network. Trend, uh, 35 of them are startups. University, uh, Montpellier University, and Quanfai, uh, a French startup, are in our network. In the network, members collaborate with IBM and with each other to advance technology, to discover and develop practical applications, and to educate peoples and train students. As I just said, IBM Quantum Cloud Service is the largest quantum computing cloud service in the world since its launch. About 250,000 users in the world have run over 400 billion quantum circuits on IBM quantum computers through via uh, cloud. More than 400 scientific papers has been published using these quantum systems. By the way, this is the IBM Q System 1 quantum computer. It is the first ever gate-based quantum computer designed for uh, business use. It, is, it has 20 uh, qubits. It is integrated in a beautiful box with optimized stability and reliability. It is put outside of a research lab. IBM collabor collaborates with countries as well. We are going to install two IBM Q System 1 outside the United States. One in Germany, the other in Japan. Some potential use cases have been identified by IBM with the help of our uh, members. There are four families of problems, four families of use cases. Some of them are for near term. That means the quantum advantage may be reached in three to five years. Others are for medium or long term. I will not go into detail about these use cases. Now, the last topic about our quantum roadmap. We released a 65 quantum computer to our clients in the, on the 1st of September this year. On mid-September, we announced our roadmap to the million plus qubit quantum computers of the future. Next year, we will have 127 qubits. In 2022, 433 qubits. By the end of 2023, we expect to have a quantum processor over 1,000 qubits. Its name is Gondor. We think of Gondor as an inflection point to implement error correction and to scale up our quantum devices to million plus qubits. This is the kind of uh, super division refrigerators that will hold Gondor and the next generation quantum computers of IBM. It is larger available, available, three meters tall, two meters wide. Remember the picture I showed you at the beginning. Almost 40 years have passed. How time flies. How research and technology advance. I've reached the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. So we have a question from the other speakers. Is the concept of a quantum volume compatible? Is it comp compatible with uh, every technological platform? Yes, yes, it's a quantum 
uh, volume is independent of the uh, hardware. And uh, for example, uh, uh, it's, worth in, it's worth noting to, uh, uh, to see that Helivea and IonQ have used uh, quantum volume recently as a metric. I think we will do the same thing as we did, as we are doing with uh, uh, AI. Uh, why not? So perhaps we can, uh, we can create a core innovation uh, project or core innovation center. Uh, for startups, the best way is, I think, like uh, Quantify, uh, become a member of uh, IBM Q network. To, 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 to benefit uh, IBM uh, research uh, about quantum computing. Thank you. OK, so now the next session will be the first pitch session. So you can, yeah, you can go on the stage. The first person will present his uh, activities is Alice and Bob. The company Addison Bob, Theo Peronin. Good evening, everyone. The mission of Addison Bob is to develop a universal, fault tolerant quantum computer and sell its computing power as a service. I'm Theo Peronin, and I co founded Addison Bob in February with my associate Raphael Lescan uh, and CTO. We are a spin-off of a strong collaboration of academic groups, including the CEA Saclay, hence our presence tonight. The, um, um, sorry. The quantum computers are no longer a matter of if, but of how and when. Experts anticipate three main eras of quantum computing. The first one, NISC uh, for noisy intermediate scale quantum machine that major players are starting to achieve nowadays correspond to the era of quantum computers crippled with errors but that already serve as training machine. Then, if one managed to correct for errors, uh, you read the full tolerance era, where the number of use cases uh, increased dramatically. But to unlock the full potential of quantum computers, you need to, to render it universal in a compatible way with your error correction. Um, and those steps come at the price of a huge uh, overhead, hence those two steps in this cartoon. The strategy of Alice and Bob is to rethink the building block, the physical qubit, to directly integrate those two technological steps and aim for the full uh, ideal quantum computer from the ground up. To do so, we leverage a special kind of superconducting qubit, the CAT qubit, that is able to correct for half of its errors, uh, to be precise, one out of two error channel, uh, through a careful engineering of uh, autonomous error correction. This autonomous error correction uh, drastically reduces the number of qubits required for overhead, for error correction, and uh, uh, for, to make it universal. Moreover, this qubit directly comes with a um, roadmap on how to assemble it into a full ideal quantum computer. We are a growing team of physicists, engineers, uh, we just raised three million euros, um, and now we are aiming to correct the remaining errors uh, before scaling up. Our next milestone that we aim for for the beginning of 2022 will be the first logical qubit. So please uh, stay tuned and join the team. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have a question from the speakers. What is the temperature of the platform? Of the? Platform. So we are working at 10 millikelvin, just like most uh, superconducting qubits, just to ensure that we are able to initialize our qubit in the ground state. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now the next 
person is Pierre Desjardins from C12 Quantum Electronics. Hello, everyone. C12 Quantum Electronics aim to develop reliable quantum processor thanks to an elementary material, carbon nanotubes. You can see a carbon nanotube on the left of the screen is the most minimal electrical wire you can imagine. And we want to transform it into a quantum transistor. Why high fidelity is of crucial importance? Because quantum computer, the first prototypes of quantum computers are making a lot of errors. And these errors come from defects in the qubit material. At C12, we are tackling the error problem at its roots. We are changing the qubit material. After 10 years of research, a brilliant research group at ENS discovered how good the carbon nanotube is for quantum electronics. The platform provides very high stability, all-to-all -all connectivity, and exponential decoupling. Thanks to these unique properties, it has the potential, if well engineered, to increase global fidelity above 50%. It's currently close to 0% when the number of qubits are higher than 20. To overcome one of the greatest and most exciting technological challenge of the decade, we funded C12 in 2020. It's a unique combination of scientific excellence and business skills. On the one hand, the <clears throat> funding team include the pioneer scientist I mentioned earlier. On the other hand, our business advisor are entrepreneurs that created very successful businesses in sectors close to quantum computing. Error reduction is the fastest route to fulfill business needs. And the platform developed by C12, based on carbon nanotube, is a prime candidate for NISC application, noisy, intermediate scale, quantum. At the first stage, we will will commercialize our chip as a quantum accelerator of a classical system. The second stage, as this qubit is semiconductor and extremely small, it has the potential to scale, and we will tap into the lar much larger universe universal error-corrected quantum computing market. With our exceptional team, we will unlock the power of carbon nanotubes to make quantum computing a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So we have a question. Can you tell us, uh, can uh, C12 uh, can work in the clean room in Paris Saclay? And is it interesting? It's, 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 we have a great challenge of uh, fabrication, and uh, we are looking for uh, partners that can uh, bring us uh, the um, quality of a semi-industrial fab. fab. So uh, let's please connect and uh, have a discussion around this. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the next presentation is from Country, and uh, Paul Iria will present the activities of Quantfi. Hello, everyone. Quantfi is providing financial solution uh, using quantum algorithm. Uh, we are, of course, uh, quantum computing experts, but we are also ex-bankers. And uh, today, uh, we can provide quantum-inspired solution that show already speed up, that can go live, of about 100,000, uh, 1,000 uh, time. And uh, we expect, of course, quantum computers that has been presented uh, here uh, to uh, go millions of time faster. Um, I need to change the slide, sorry. So um, our products are quite easy to remember. 
we have uh, Kiwi and Kawa. So Kawa is the quantum-inspired part that I mentioned. And these are products that are ready to go live today. Kiwi is the universal quantum computing part for products that are going to go live optimization, risk management, with interface uh, that can be simply for end user under Excel or uh, for programmer under uh, Python API. So our Kiwi, uh, which is Universal Quantum Computing Library, is uh, based uh, on IBM Qiskit. We are part of the IBM Q network, as mentioned by uh, IBM. And we are at the moment working with uh, major financial institutions like Morgan Stanley, Bloomberg, uh, to beta test uh, this library that will become open source. Uh, for uh, Quantum Ready, we are working with Toshiba, which has a Quantum Ready uh, software called the uh, Simultaneous Bifurcation Machine, and with uh, financial institutions like uh, Nast West on portfolio optimization, typically. Uh, we offer, beside the two products, Kiwi and Kawa, professional services. For universal quantum computing, it can be training. Many institutions are still uh, looking at universal quantum computing, but not uh, really using it. We provide research services, prototype, project. And for quantum inspired, we can go live uh, after performance tests and projects. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we have a question from the speakers. As you know, the companies Candela and Pascal will provide hardware and common facilities. Um, can you come come to test their um, software there? Uh, are you interested to come in their uh, facilities? Uh, so I didn't understand everything, but if the question is whether we collaborate? Yeah, it's like a common facilities with many companies, uh, quantum computing companies, of mm. course. Uh, it's like a hub, a cluster of uh, quantum uh, companies in the Paris Saclay. Yeah, really so. Uh, interesting for a company like uh, Quantfree. So we are working with a hardware uh, maker like uh, Pascal, uh, not only with IBM, uh, so that uh, we can bring them use case from the financial uh, sector and test them on their computers. The next presentation will be provided by Robert Marino from the company Qubit Pharma. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And tonight, I try to uh, show you how you can use quantum physics in order to design better drugs faster. Um, simulation has been used by biopharma for over 30 years. They heavily invested in simulation tools. And they can now run large chemical libraries and confirm if a molecule will react with a given target in the human body. Yet, um, despite all the investment, they still have to confirm the simulation by experiment because accuracy of the simulations are, is limited due to one thing. It's because if you want to be sure, 100% sure of your simulation, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation. And it's actually not possible on classical computer. So simplica simplification and approximations are key, and that was done over the last 30 years. One of the examples, for instance, was to replace many-body interaction by a sum of two-body classical interaction. It works when there, is not, when there were not that many ions in the molecules that do uh, complexify the calculations. Another way also to simplify uh, the calculation and give approximate, uh, good but approximative results is to start from experimental data that already exists. For instance, take a small molecule and modify part of it. What you will get is a relative free binding energy. And if you already get data points, you can have something that is uh, acceptable for uh, the beginning of your pipeline. Problem is, all easy problems were almost solved and uh, real life comes with real problems. Here I show you a slide where you have two anti-cancer drugs that are li um, linked to the B12 vitamin in order to access the target in, into the human body. 
as you can see, we have uh, transition metal there, a lot of different molecules, a very large molecule, so very complex calculation. And for that, a uh, simple calculation are, are most of the time uh, deceptive. Another problem that arises since the beginning of the two, 2000s is what we call de novo design. It's actually fairly interesting for pharma. We use generative algorithm in order to create completely new molecules uh, that were not invented by, chemi by um, neither found in nature or invented by, um, by chemists. Uh, and we will test their performance over a certain target. Yet the problem with de novo design is that the molecules are completely new, so most of the time you don't have experimental data points to start calculation from. Hence, you need something else. And here comes Qubit Pharmaceuticals. We have embedded uh, almost everything uh, that we could in quantum physics into our simulation software in order to solve those two major problems, that is designing and, and testing complex molecules that represent roughly 40% of the human body, all those are, uh, such as metalloproteas, and help uh, validate um, the new molecules that are found through de novo design. Um, all our performance are often benchmarked. Here I present the, the, the results that we had in an international open blind contest called Sample. Um, the benchmark is on the left part of the slide. The, our results are on the, on the right side. What was aimed was to put all the red dots, all the ligand within a 2K Cal error, um, uh, error bar. So we already design and already give a very accurate result, very fast, orders of magnitude better than, uh, than what uh, already exists. But our clients deserve better and faster. And that's why we are mixing HPC and supercomputer with the incoming quantum computers. Here you have the one that from Pascal in order to continue to increase the speed and accuracy of our results. So reach out to us if you want to use our computing power and the incoming power of quantum physics in order to um, design your new blockbuster. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a question to you. Yeah. What kind of uh, HPC requirements to perform you, you, you need to perform your um, relevant computation? Um, so we have invested a lot into optimization. Um, we can use, um, we can start from sim uh, sim very simple GPUs, so not HPC, up to the last simulation we ran was 1000 one uh, V100 from NVIDIA, so the last GPUs together in parallel. So we can really um, use the full power of uh, the existing platforms. We uh, use the Gen C, for instance, platform in order to, um, to perform work on, on Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all speakers of this session. The next session will be held by um, Marco Rancis from Total. So Marco is the uh, head of Quantum. Uh, hello, I am Marco Rancic, and uh, as announced, I am Total's head of Quantum Computing. I'm going to give something which is going to be a business and a science overview somewhat of the quantum computing activities uh, we have uh, in total, with a strong focus on why do we really use quantum computing in the energy uh, industry. Uh, what are the main challenges that we are encountering as a big energy company, and why is really total the next technology in which uh, money should be invested, in which research capabilities should be invested, and they came up with quantum computing. And the question is, where do we use quantum computing and where do we foresee uh, that quantum computing is going to be used in total? Uh, first, uh, uh, we are quite heavily involved in using quantum computing in modeling of our optimization uh, problems. And regarding the technology readiness level in this domain, I would say that we are quant quite advanced with current day quantum annealers and NISC uh, devices. Uh, our next natural step being an energy company solving equations for physics in things like combustion or improving lubrification, etc. Uh, however, the technology gap here with such, with such technology for solving differential equations is still quite large. Current day NISC devices are still not able to capture the true quantum speed up of solving a partial differential equation on a quantum computer. And it's quite likely that uh, basically the quantum advantage there is going to be in the years to come, in more, more likely in the decade to come. And uh, of course, like uh, most uh, people are doing globally, we are quite heavily involved in modeling uh, of, of chemistry and material science uh, uh, systems. 
where quantum speed up is already going to kick in on the order of 200 qubits. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we are quite, uh, we have quite a lot of partners in the both quantum hardware and quantum software uh, domain. It's a bit of a clever game for us how to combine adequate quantum hardware with uh, adequate uh, quantum software. And we're really heavily involved in that and exploring all different type of, uh, type of uh, cap capabilities. And, and this is how it really looks, uh, how it really looks in total. Uh, what you're seeing here, you're seeing here a list of our partners and collaborators. With some of the companies and universities which you he he see here, we do have a signed agreement. Uh, with some of the companies or universities which you see here, we did have a signed agreement. With some of the companies we are negotiating, but with some of the companies we are really nego we are really uh, we are really collaborating in a sense like research groups and at universities really do collaborate one with another. So on a purely science first level and uh, basically taking all intellectual property and, and everything on the side. This is really a collaboration between, uh, between a trust of brains like any collaboration you would see uh, at the university. First we have uh, QCWare and we are quite heavily involved with QCWare uh, in the quantum annealer domain for optimization and this is really not uh, something I am at, uh, at liberty uh, to uh, provide details uh, about. Uh, then we are we were both speaking with uh, Xanadu uh, in Canada, in Toronto, Google and uh, Pascal about getting real access to their hardware running our in-house algorithm on their actual uh, devices. Uh, we have many, many software partners. Uh, our primary uh, software partner is Atos. We are a premium customer of Atos in the quantum computing domain. We are a customer of theirs, meaning that we purchased Atos's 35 qubit uh, simulator and it's based in our uh, supercomputing center uh, down in Po. This is the platform uh, which most of our researchers really use uh, to develop quantum uh, algorithms. And then there's uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing, which is a quite prospective startup from uh, the UK. And here we are really involved in modeling PhD students, Serfax with one PhD student and, and a postdoc, University of Paris Sud, and so on and so forth. Uh, how, how we structured our quantum computing uh, 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 research portfolio is structured into something called sub-projects. Sub-projects are well-defined teams and I, uh, already, I already introduced them and now I'm going to try to give you a bit of a deeper dive why do we care for modeling, for instance, uh, optimization uh, in total. Well, first uh, we are basically uh, quite heavily involved into, into greener energy. These days we have a strategy of being carbon neutral by uh, 2050 and, and uh, then in that context a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, charging station optimization problems uh, have, uh, have occurred in total. We do, when you have a fleet of vehicle and you want to charge them electrically, you want to know what are the best points where you need to put your uh, basically charger, but also in the domains of uh, computational geometry. Uh, which you're going to see later, we are quite involved in uh, mod. Uh, basically, uh, basically, the first thing which I really want to uh, present here is uh, our uh, graph partitioning uh, algorithm applied for a problem of mesh coloring. Uh, basically, what is mesh coloring? It's, it's, it's uh, mesh, mesh segmentation, uh, to, to be more general. Uh, basically, it's a problem in computational geometry where you have a computational object and you try to decompose these com com computational uh, objects in, into basically a series of surfaces. And then a question arises, where do you put the boundary between, uh, between uh, basically two computational surfaces in computational geometry? Uh, so this part of research was done by an intern uh, of ours. It, it, it was kicked off some six months ago. And recently we got funding from the European Union uh, to continue to pursue our research here. And this was within the Horizon 2020 uh, grant where we're going to hire a PhD student to investigate uh, graph partitioning for uh, computational geometry uh, problems. Uh, basically, uh, our line of research in Leiden is namely also involved with uh, uh, 
uh, optimization problems. And we have an ongoing collaboration there with Professor Veran Dunjko and two, and two of the PhD students, which we are financing. And basically, the idea between this, behind this uh, line of research is the following. Uh, quantum resources are quite costly. So when you want to run a computation on a quantum computer, you have to queue up, for instance, in the IBM Syslogons are better off being run on a classical computer. And uh, the key result, which you can see here, uh, is basically that in 96% uh, 96% a percent of the time, uh, uh, of the time, uh, the quantum computer is beating uh, classical methods for uh, graph cut uh, problem, and we recently expanded this line of research with another PhD student because we believe it's it's quite uh, perspective, especially in this time where quantum resources are quite quite expensive, uh, quite quite expensive to have. Uh, in the chemistry domain, uh, our, uh, what we call chemistry, chemistry materials is probably the most, the best way how I would define this line of research. Uh, and it, it follows sort of two directions. Uh, one direction is carbon neutrality, where we are involved in modeling materials for uh, carbon capture. And another uh, type of uh, applications are uh, novel battery materials. Uh, Total is in possession of soft. Uh, this uh, what you see here, and I'm uh, showing you a bit of the results, some teasers uh, from our uh, from our uh, in-house actions. Uh, what you're seeing here, and let let me perhaps start with the left side of the slide. Uh, we do have two in we implement the two in-house algorithms uh, in the chemistry domain, the VQE and the ITE algorithm, both developed on Atlas's uh, QLM uh, machine. We did it for the noisy simulations, and we even did some very, very basic uh, runnings with the actual hardware. Uh, what you're seeing uh, in the bottom right is basically how our uh, in-house VQE solver compares to classical state-of-the-art methods. And we are currently one to three percent away uh, from classical state-of-the-art for a set of very basic molecules like uh, CO2, methane, and so on and so forth. Now what you're seeing in your upper right corner of the uh, slide is a material called MOF5. Uh, this is the, really the holy grail of our, of our research in uh, quantum computing. And let me tell you a bit what is, uh, what is MOF5. Uh, it's, it's, a porous, uh, it's a porous material which is used for carbon capture. Uh, so it, comp it composes out of uh, metallic clusters, which are the gray things that you're seeing uh, in this uh, image, and it consists of benzene linkers. And the material is a porous material. The big yellow ball which you're seeing is a pore. It's empty space. And these materials serve as somewhat of filters, which are then used to filter out carbon uh, CO2 from uh, basically a combustion gas. Uh, and uh, basically, we are also really heavily involved in this. This is the uh, focal point of a collaboration uh, uh, with uh, C CQC from the UK, and uh, here you're, what you're seeing uh, here you're seeing the results uh, of an aluminum aluminum fumarate, uh, which is a common uh, metallic cluster in metal organic frameworks, which is a really large uh, class of materials. Uh, however, the problem with these materials are that they're really difficult to model on current day hardware because they have uh, you know 500,000 orbitals, and you need an exact model to be able to predict the carbon capture uh, capabilities. So we are still resorting to some kind of uh, fragmentation techniques uh, in modeling uh, CO2 capture. But what we're expecting, we're expecting as the qubit number increases in the chemistry domain, that we are eventually going to have quantum speed up uh, in our CO2 capture uh, research. And we are also expanding our CO2 capture to novel materials such as uh, graphene, uh, which, you're, which you're basically seeing here. And this is another line of research where we are uh, basically funded by the EU, where EU provided funding within our NASQC uh, consortium. And here we uh, got one PhD student uh, to, basic, to basically work on, for instance, benzene and how good is benzene as a filter to, carb to sort of filter out uh, CO2, uh, CO2 from air. Uh, last but not least, uh, I want to speak about uh, the battery material, uh, battery, our battery material uh, research. We are eventually hoping to run uh, this type of uh, simulations on a Pascal's uh, hardware, which is a startup uh, from uh, from uh, Paris Saclay. Uh, of, of course, the hardware is not ready, so so. But it's, we're really hoping that it's going to be ready soon, quite soon, so so soon that that we are going to be able to get results of uh, conduction modeling of battery electro electro materials quite soon.
And let me tell you what the bottleneck here. What you're seeing in your upper uh, right corner, first you're seeing a lithium ion battery. This lithium ion battery has a lithium cobalt oxide electrode. And how this lithium cobalt oxide electrode behaves, as lithium escapes from the electrode, the electrode becomes insulated. It stops conducting electricity. And the main question is why does it stop conducting electricity? And there are some beliefs that there's a second order uh, topological transition occurring here, uh, what type of uh, metal to insulate or transition. And what Pascal's hardware allows us to do, it really allows us to model it similarly, similarly, and it's a similar type of a physical problem, if you want, which you would encounter in a high temperature uh, su superconductor. It's basically uh, something what is called that. Uh, le last but not least, and I won't have time for a deep dive here, uh, of, about our uh, research in uh, PDEs. Uh, we are quite involved in uh, PDE research, but as I said in the beginning, uh, this is a bit more a future, uh, something which is going to provide usable results uh, in the future. We have a PhD student building our own internal quantum LAPAC library, and for all of you who don't know it, LAPAC is a linear algebra package which is used on classical computers to do things like matrix multiplication, matrix inversion, and so on and so forth. And we have postdocs investigating current day NISC algorithms to solve uh, PDEs. And we have uh, uh, one postdoc who is basically investigating trying to estimate when is going, it going to be a proper time, how many qubits are we going to need in a universal quantum computer to solve partial differential equations which are of interest to the top. And in conclusion, uh, our goal and the whole goal of the project uh, which I'm managing really aim to be a recognized player in quantum algorithms in the energy industry, much like we are in HPC, I would say, uh, now. And with this, uh, I would conclude and take any questions, if there are any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marco. So we have a question. As you know, the French tech community is focusing on the businesses and economic development. Mm -hmm. um, could you please uh, give, give us how total, uh, how, what is the business per per perspective, sorry, related to quantum computing? Well, for, for us, clearly, we are an energy company, so we're not expecting to sell uh, quantum algorithms to anybody. We are not really expecting to generate revenue from quantum computing. Most of the startups, which you see here, they are either companies who uh, create hardware or create software for quantum computing. For us, it's really a supporting uh, kind of business, much like our high-performance computing, which which moves along the, all of the lines we have in total, such as low carbon electricity, such as novel material development. And in our case, it's more of an aiding tool, which we have to sort of use as a catalyzer for all of this, uh, for all of these businesses we have at Total. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Marco. Thank it was Marco from Total. So for the next sessions, we will have the opportunity to hear about Pascal Selenar. So, Okay, good evening. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Hi, I'm Pascal Senelar. I'm a CNRS researcher and I'm coordinating the Center for Quantum Science and Quantum Technology in the Paris Saclay area. And our objective is to support the French quantum ecosystem. So, just a few words first on the strengths and the challenges that the Paris Saclay area has to participate to the build up of the national quantum ecosystem. So as it was already mentioned before, we have many assets in this uh, area to participate at the best level of quantum technologies. We investigate in the paris saclay area all major pe technological platforms, be it cold atoms, like for the Pascal quantum uh, simulator, superconducting qubits, quantum and topological matter, quantum light, spintronics, quantum nanoelectronics, defects in diamond, etc. With these different platforms, we participate to developing new applications in, in all the fields of quantum technologies, from quantum computing, quantum simulation, quantum sensing, and the development of quantum networks. Being a bit more precise, in the Paris Saclay area, we have very important ingredients here. We have high-level education, with no less than four master programs, five engineering programs in quantum technologies. Overall, it's 300, 350 master students every year, 
and more than 100 quantum PhD uh, every year. We have overall 50 research teams, so I'm discussing about fundamental research here, with uh, research at the best level, as it can be seen by the fact that we have a Nobel laureate, Albert Fert, a CNRS gold medal, Alain Aspect, coming from the Paris Saclay area, eight CNRS silver medals, and more than 33 laureates of the European Research Council, which is another kind of uh, significant mark of very high quality research. Overall, it's a typically one publication a day. Another important ingredient of our uh, area is uh, we have highly connected at the international level. So I'm zooming in here to show you this map of all the collaboration that we have between Saclay area and everywhere in the world. And if I zoom in the, within Europe, you will see that our campus is key players in quantum technologies over Europe. Last but not least, and of course it's very important for today's event, the Paris Saclay academic community is already quite well connected to the startups and industry. We have seen the emergence of very emblematic startups in this domain, such as Pascal and Quandela, but also startups supporting, uh, providing supporting technologies. And also we have connections with major big companies investing in quantum technologies. So what are the challenges? The challenges, I would like to phrase it like, mind the gaps in the innovation chain. We have this very long innovation chain and in quantum technologies, the link between fundamental research, engineering, proof of concept, the development of startup to industrialization is very, very important. And uh, we need to be very careful about the gaps. And one of the very distinctive feature of quantum technology is that we have gaps maybe at the first node of this chain uh, between fundamental research and innovation. And this, this is one of the gaps that we need to fill, to bridge, but there are others. The other challenge is that we have to really make this uh, quantum ecosystem emerge is that we have missing links. Missing links or links to be enforced between industry and research, but also in dif into different parts of this support the quantum ecosystem. And we can contribute to um, somehow make all the synergies that we need to, uh, to move faster together. And this is why we created the Center for Quantum Science and Quantum Technology in Paris-Saclay. So this center was an initiative by the University of Paris-Saclay and was created last year. This is a picture of um, Sylvie Rotaillot announcing the creation of Quantum uh, together with our academic partners, CNRS, CIA, and INRIA. And recently, the Institut Polytechnique de Paris joined us uh, to really have this co uh, constructive uh, interaction on quantum technologies. We want to put all the different ingredients that I just mentioned, uh, uh, just mentioned uh, in synergy. So I already mentioned the startups, the research, the education, it's very central that we have new education programs to support the ecosystem, the partnership with different industrials. And I would like to add this ingredient that we have also in Saclay, a large facility for technology, the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, which is a very important and other uh, small clean rooms that are very important facilities to develop these technologies. So what are the objectives? What is the mission that we think we should have in the construction of this quantum ecosystem? First, we have to play a role on the fundamental research. The quantum technologies needs to continue to feed on the fundamental research. And this research needs to be more and more interdisciplinary. And we need to keep fundamental research going and working in close collaboration with applied research, hand in hand. And this can happen when people work together on the same place uh, on an everyday basis. The other thing that we want to work on and we are working on is the development of new tailored education programs. We are working very hard to think on how to adapt our master programs and engineering programs to include the different parameters to, uh, that we need, like inter interdisciplinarity and also, um, well, you know, uh, uh, make the links that the students need to know to contribute at the best level. And also we want to develop an offer for professional education because it's going to take time to educate all these young researchers so we can also help um, engineers already in place in the industry to catch up the quantum train. We want to reinforce the links between research and industry. Uh, it's really the breeding ground for innovation. We're thinking of initiatives like innovation tracking 
and increasing the link between education and industry in these quantum technologies. Overall, uh, we want to make uh, of the Paris Cycler area uh, a very uh, visible, uh, and, uh, and uh, this place is already a major player at the national level for quantum technology. We want to make sure that this major player is visible at the international level, is able to attract the best students at the international level, the best talents. And we think that we can have a structure that can be flight, light and flexible to support the French quantum initiative locally. So I want just to finish this, my, my presentation with a very uh, emblematic uh, action that we took collectively. And this is what we just created last year, well, this year, actually. It's a new training program. So normally, if you consider education programs, you have students following a path in basically, mostly physics. They do a master's degree in physics, quantum physics, and do a PhD in quantum technologies on the physics side. Or they do applied mathematics, computer science, join the effort in quantum information, and do a PhD in quantum information. And you see that you have parallel paths here that don't cross, to, don't talk to each other at any stage in this, in this uh, program. And of course, this reflects on the development, on the research, and uh, later on, on the innovation. So we just created a new education program that is inserted at the middle of the slide I'm presenting now, which is called Artec. It's the next trial that we have created between the first year and the second year of quantum of master uh, education. The idea of this year is that it is open to students coming from very different backgrounds, from physics, applied physics, engineering, chemistry even, applied mathematics and computer science. And we give the opportunity of these students to follow an extra one year of education focused exclusively on quantum technologies. They can continue then going a, quantum, uh, a, master, a second year of master in quantum physics of quantum information, and then join the global field of quantum technologies with a real interdisciplinary education. It's a very nice um, program, uh, unique in France, actually. And we are very proud that we were able to do it by joining the efforts of many actors in the Paris Saclay area. First, this is an education program that is uh, supported by uh, teachers and uh, professors from both University Paris Saclay and Institut Polytechnique de Paris, and all the different components. Uh, you can see here the names of the lecturers. We introduce the students, we give them the basics of quantum physics for quantum technology, the basics of computer science for quantum technology. We share with them the different point of view, different perspective from physics and computer science and quantum information. We teach them how to fabricate qubits, quantum hardware, both, bo based both on light and matter. We give them clues to start understanding quantum matter and topological qubits, and then we discuss quantum machine learning and the links with neuromorphic. This education program, it's one year, one full year, four months of lectures and a personal project, then six months of internship in a private or public quantum technology lab. Last but not least, we want these students to have followed a, a short entrepreneurship training so that they can contribute to the field later on. So you see, this is a very nice collaboration. And you can see here three logos for companies who have uh, sponsored this training. Because when you offer students the possibility to have a, an extra year of education, it has a cost. And we want that, that this, um, this uh, training, is the education program, is open to students of all kinds of social backgrounds. So Early Kid, Antos, and Total were very kind to contribute to sponsor the, uh, the, the support that we give to the student to join this extra year of education. So this is a very nice example of what we can do if we were all, work all together, acknowledging the fact that, of course, these students and will be ready to work both in the private and the public uh, research sector. So this is uh, the last slide. I want just to uh, summarize what we are trying to do. We are working very hard to support the French ecosystem in the Paris Cyclé area. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready for your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascal. So I have a question. Um, the abroad startups can join the community? Sorry? The abroad startups, the foreign startups can join the community? Uh, well, I, I think we need to discuss, of course. It's, uh, with the community, I mean. So what you want the, who, the startups join the, the, the university? Yeah. So we have startups or, who are partners of the center. For yeah, quantum. but it's almost uh, French startups, right? Yes, they are French startups. So, do, so can foreign 
startup join. I mean, uh, we need to discuss. Of course, I think in this quantum technologies, uh, it's a very, very uh, international effort. So there is, I don't see any reason why not. And the last question is, um, the startups can contact more the students or the engineering students in the university and how it's possible? How to, can they contact the students? Yeah. yeah. So we are working, so this, we created the, the, the quantum a year ago, but then there was the COVID crisis and everything was slowed down. So we are now uh, working hard to create the infrastructure to support all that, to, to have support the students and the industry, for instance. So we will make this possible and uh, by different tools. So there will be a person in charge of this kind of connections and then uh, it's gonna be uh, like, uh, you know. Uh, uh, we are thinking for instance of program, like if you think of a small project that your company needs to do, okay? Like, I don't know, explore uh, a market. Um, what we need is uh, if a company needs such a, a small program, what a possibility is that such a small uh, study can be done by a PhD student as an extra uh, activity for he or his or her PhD. PhD students at University Paris-Saclay, they have to do something else than research. And this something else can be very diverse. It can be a uh, market study, it can be a technical study, etc. If companies have small projects like that that are suited for this kind of project, they could contact us and we can put them as an offer for the students who can just pick up this mini project and help the company and get new education skills. Thank you, it was very clear. Thank, Thank you. you, Pascal. Thank you. So the next session will be the second pitching session. So I will give the opportunity to the speaker to come on stage. And I will call the first speaker from Crio Concept, Pierre Perrault. Good evening. So uh, I do represent uh, the company CRA Concept France. So this company has been created uh, with a technological transfer from CEA Saclay, the low temperature laboratory in 2001. CRA Concept designs and built ultra low temperature dilution refrigerator dedica dedicated to fundamental research in physics. More than 100 of our systems are currently used in many domains, like nanoscience, black matter, condensed matter, and quantum physics. The team and manufacturing plants are located at Les Ulis, Courtabeuf, from where we deliver our system worldwide. So our business is uh, to uh, do the development, the design, and assemble the system we install and service them. We sell and market them worldwide. And we have representatives in Japan, Korea, and China. We have a large product range uh, with the, the dry system, the dynamic and performance in three size, and a range of wet system, which were the first one to be built but uh, now uh, we are still built, despite the fact that the dry are the more uh, sold in the markets. Uh, so we are selling in France, in Japan, United States, and the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, since uh, 2014, uh, we are selling 64% of exa dry compared to the exa wet. Uh, even though now we are selling far more exa dry in percentage uh, those days. Now, uh, concerning uh, the low temperature for the quantum computing, so how far Q quantum computers need to be cold? So they uh, need to be cold down to 10 millikelvin, uh, which, which is near absolute zero minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Who are concerned by ULT? 
in quantum computing. In fact, there is uh, a lot of different uh, or six families of technologies, but we are addressing the quantum annealing, the superconductors, electron spin, CMOS, the topological, where the trapped ion, cold atoms, diamond cavity, runs with lasers and linear optics runs at room temperature. So they either create their own low temperature or they don't need low temperature. We have delivered the two first system uh, at the team of uh, QQ in Grenoble, uh, the team uh, of uh, combining CEA, CNRS, and uh, uh, UGA, uh, who are developing uh, the uh, CMOS uh, quantum computing at Grenoble. And recently, our liquid uh, took control of CRA concept in the late uh, July. Uh, so now we are part of a very uh, large group and uh, we are prepared to address uh, the worldwide market of uh, the quantum computing uh, with a, a large company who are addressing low temperature uh, originally since uh, a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I will come back to uh, the last uh, slide. How is it to be integrated to like a big company, big firm like uh, Air Liquide? So uh, we arrived to a point where we were uh, good enough to address the, uh, the research market, but to enter uh, the quantum computing, uh, it was needing uh, far more capacity in terms of uh, research, people, structure. So for a small company, uh, it is a bit uh, almost impossible uh, to address efficiently this market. Now, with a large group like Air Liquide, this is possible. So the next presentation will be, yeah, give by Nicolo Somachi from Candela. Thank you for the introduction, and hello everybody. I'm Nicolo Somaschi, I'm a co-founder of Candela, which is a startup providing building blocks to develop optical uh, quantum technologies. A uh, few words about Candela. Created in 2017, three employees, now we are more than 10. We are actually one of the few startups in the world actually commercializing quantum system. We have concluded our first investment round in 2020 with Quantonation and the support of BPA France. And we are actually expanding our team and our uh, sites. So we are based in the Center of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Palaiso to exploit one of the largest clean room in uh, Europe for production. And we have now our main offices in Massy where we also develop a new R&D lab which will also serve as open facility. Our main products are uh, single photon sources based on semiconductor, quantum dot, of the size of a few uh, micrometers. And these systems are uh, nice because they uh, behave like artificial atoms, which means that we can coherently control the system so to make it meet uh, efficiently one single photon after the other. So they are also integrated, which means that we can use uh, uh, foundries to develop these uh, chips we can fabricate many of them in a small uh, size. And uh, what is important is that the design allows for high efficiently coupling in optical fiber, which means that these devices can be uh, connected to other platform and other module to a developed uh, platform for communication and computing. And this is what our uh, uh, clients and users are uh, looking for. Quantum computing with photon is uh, actually really uh, powerful because photons, uh, compared to other quantum computing platforms, don't suffer the coherence, which is one of the main problems for matter-based qubit. Most of the components are also room temperature, so easy to uh, manage and cheaper. And because of the modular uh, connection through optical fiber, we can develop optical platform based on few uh, modules interconnected, as you can see here. First, a qubit generator, 
basically a single photon source producing single photon which are then sent in an optical circuit for example an integrated circuit where through waveguides and we split the, this photon mix and they are controlled with phase shifter to represent specific unitary specific uh, protocol then the calculation is performed and we uh, we measure the uh, results of the computation with single photon detector and we can also add an additional feedback to optimize the uh, results. So our idea is to uh, use our single photon source, standalone si single photon source, Prometheus, and to integrate additional integrated circuit and detector which can be purchased by uh, to other companies and to perform specific tasks. So our team will develop the architecture of these integrated circuits to reproduce specific protocols and algorithms which uh, will be based on, uh, on an increasing number of qubits, starting then from sampling to uh, hybrid classical quantum variational algorithm focused on optimization. We will also develop all the levels so to allow user to control uh, the system and uh, basically test their software. So this system is reconfigurable, so there will be several chips that can be uh, uh, put in place so to study and develop different uh, problems. And one of the major advantages is that it's naturally connected, so it can be uh, by default interconnecting in a, in a network, in a quantum communication network, or even implement a distributed quantum computing with different modules. So feel free uh, to contact us and uh, to uh, join our reconfigurable optical quantum computing platform. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nicolo. I have a question for you. Can you tell uh, us more about your technology? Are you uh, using like uh, the quantum cryptography or the quantum computing or both? So you mean lithography? Yeah, Cri uh, cryptography, sorry. Cryptography? Yeah, yes. thank you. So uh, actually uh, the users, so our clients are mostly uh, R&D labs, academic and private, which develops protocol both for quantum computing and to uh, study proof of principle uh, quantum communication protocol, which also include quantum cryptography. One of our first products in this reconfigurable platform will be actually to develop a device-independent uh, quantum random number generator. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks. The next presentation. So it will be about the startup very, very cloud. Anne Marin, the floor. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So I'm Anne Marin, and I'm working at VeriCloud, which is a French startup uh, in quantum security and communication. So data is the oil of the 21st century. Uh, in the physical world, uh, re valuable resources uh, uh, need, uh, are protected with physical security. Similarly, in, in a digital world, uh, valuable resources need protection, which is the role of cybersecurity. And for the most important resources, quantum networks offers the highest level of security. Uh, indeed, the security is everlasting, which uh, means that uh, unlike uh, when using fully classical encryption, an event dropper cannot intercept the data and decrypt it later in the future when uh, sufficient computational power are available. Uh, in addition, quantum networks already e exist. China has built a 2,000 kilometer uh, network in 2018, and both the US and Europe are currently developing their uh, own uh, quantum communication infrastructure. So, uh, our goal at VeriCloud is uh, to uh, bring quantum cybersecurity at the scale of a data center. For this purpose, we have, uh, we have developed HiCloud, which is a hybrid cloud infrastructure. So more precisely, we like to think of HiCloud as the Ethernet of quantum communication. On the one hand, it consists of several layers of technologies. On the other, other hand, uh, it, uh, HiCloud offers a three level of security. It secures communication, storage, and computation, which means that a client uh, can directly compute on top of encrypted data, which allow him to use those data and ensure their security at the same time. So here we are talking about uh, securing classical computing. 
in the longer term, a high cloud and quantum uh, uh, network will evolve by connected more and more quantum hardware. This will allow more application, uh, um, stronger security, and secure distributed computing. So in this model, uh, some client, for example, uh, built by Candela, will, uh, that have um, some limited uh, uh, quantum resources, will have access to a remote quantum computer, for example, built by Pascal, and uh, the client will uh, delegate to it the execution of an encrypted quantum program, which will uh, uh, form a complete uh, secure quantum cloud infrastructure. So about uh, EveriCloud in a few words, uh, EveriCloud was founded uh, by three uh, experts in quantum technologies, uh, and we are currently six engineers uh, from various backgrounds and one PhD student working together at the development of our product. Uh, in addition, EveriCloud is already a um, prominent actor uh, of, uh, qu of uh, quantum technologies in Europe. We are part uh, of uh, the most important uh, uh, project, uh, development project, both in uh, the industrial and in the academic uh, sector, and we are partnering with research institutions in uh, France and UK. Uh, to conclude, uh, um, several countries are currently building uh, uh, quantum networks. Our approach at VeriCloud is uh, complementary, more uh, bottom-up. Our goal is to make a small network grow and grow and connect to each other uh, toward a global quantum internet that will offer the highest level of protection for privacy, data, and computation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. So I, I have a question for you. Um, if we understand well, um, quantum computing, is it a, an opportunity for VeriCloud, which provides security solution against the future uh, quantum computer? Is it uh, more like um, an opportunity to provide more security solutions for the uh, future? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the, um, making ever um, if the hard, uh, quantum hardware uh, evolve and uh, um, the, the, the yes, it can we can reach uh, several uh, other layer um, of security with uh, more evolved uh, quantum hardware. Thank you. For cryptographic protocols. Thank you so much, and the last presentation. So it will be the startup Pascal. Georges Olivier Raymond on the stage. Good evening. My name is George. I'm the CEO and e co-founder of Pascal. I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I would like to thank the, uh, the organizer for organizing such a nice meeting. You probably think your smartphone is powerful because it's millions of times faster than the Apollo computer. That's impressive, right? But even if you are able to make millions of cell phones working together, it would still not be enough to tackle the most serious issues. Fortunately, we can increase our power if we go quantum. This is not a surprise. The first quantum revolution already led to the discoveries of a computer, the laser, or brain imaging. Until very recently, we have not been able to use the most impressive quantum feature there is, entanglement. When two particles are entangled, each of them being called a, a quantum bit or a qubit, a change in one particle immediately changes the other one. It then becomes possible to act on several qubits at the same time, and thus to perform massively parallel operations. We can use this new computing power to improve all sectors. We can, for instance, use it to simulate complex biological processes and speed up the finding of new drugs. Or optimizing the distribution of energy like never before and strongly reduce our carbon, foot our carbon footprint. And you know what? It doesn't take more than five hair dryers to power a quantum computer. So, why is it so hard to get there? Today, companies like Google or IBM did not succeed in building a quantum processor with more than 70 qubits. These numbers are really hard to scale. But two researchers working at CNRS on Plateau de Saclay opened a new path. They found a unique way to control these qubits with lasers and finally paved the way up to 1,000 qubits 
to give us the computing power we need to solve the challenges of today. They joined to create Pascal, a team of six scientists with a combined experience of 100 years. But we do not only publish in nature or science, we also have profound expertise in uh, technology industrialization, business, and venture capital. Our technology is already working in the lab and has proven that we can finally scale the number of qubits. We build multi-purpose, flexible quantum processors out of the technology of natural atoms. They come with a full software stack, from processor controls to applications to directly solve the hardest problems of our customers. You should know that the computing power is doubling every extra qubit. So, going from 70 to 1,000 is not simply make, making progress. It means creating a new future. When I was a PhD student, almost 20 years ago, I would never have imagined that today the second quantum revolution will come true. I am now convinced that quantum computing can change our life. Pascal can build the most powerful quantum computer ever. Let us make it happen now, not tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. No, Pascal, bonjour, Olivier. Thank you. I have a question for you. Um, are there European initiatives to promote quantum computers in HPC centers? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the, the joint undertaking uh, EuroHPC which is in charge of, uh, of developing the uh, HPC ecosystem in Europe, uh, did a, t a, ten a tenders for the early installation of uh, quantum processors into uh, uh, European HPC centers. And Pascal is part of the consortium uh, which uh, bid to this, uh, to this tender. And we plan to uh, the early installation of two quantum processors, one in France, one in Germany, as soon as uh, 2022. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Georges Olivier. It was the last, last uh, session of a pitch. So now it will be the last session, the round table with the VC. Uh, we will come back in a few moments, in one minute maximum, the time to arrange the stage and give one micro to each speaker.
Bonjour. Hello. Thank you for everyone to stay late for this last session. Uh, I'm very pleased to moderate this session with the free VC. And uh, I would like first to ask these people to introduce yourself. So please, who want to, to start? Hello, I'm Mathieu Replin. I'm an investment manager with Airbus Ventures. Shall we introduce our, our funds? Oh, uh, yeah. OK, yeah. so Airbus Ventures is a early stage VC fund. We operate independently from the Airbus group. Um, the team is roughly 10 people spread all across the world, uh, headquartered in the US. We have uh, three people in Europe and also two people in Japan. So far, we have about 40 uh, portfolio companies, uh, again, spread across the world. Our investment thesis is anchored around Series A, let's say. We invest usually between half a million and five million uh, mm. check size. We can invest up to 10 million in some cases. And from um, a sectorial perspective, we are looking at everything that is uh, potentially impacting the aerospace industry on the long run. Uh, this is articulated around uh, uh, seven verticals, and uh, one of those verticals is actually uh, what we call frontier tech, where we actually put uh, quantum computing. OK. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Jean-Gabriel Bueno. I'm working at Quantum Nation. I hope that after tonight, you won't think that uh, quantum computing is not is frontier tech and that we are able to provide you a better overview of what is currently being built in Europe and especially in France uh, on quantum computing, but also on other fields. So Quantum Nation, we are the first VC fund dedicated to quantum technologies. We have 12 companies in portfolio. We are currently raising a 50 million fund, and we are aiming to our first close in the next weeks. Team is composed of four people. There are three partners and myself. Out of the three partners are Charles Begbede, who is a serial entrepreneur, Christophe Jorzak, who has a PhD in quantum physics, and Olivier Tonneau, who uh, invested uh, Charles money in the last 10 years, and I uh, salute, uh, salute them uh, <laughs> right now. We invest worldwide at precedent and seed level, also due to the maturity of the field, and we write checks uh, from uh, 100k euros up to 500k euros. We have a really hands-on strategy. Uh, I'm also at the board of Candela, who uh, had the opportunity to pitch uh, just before. And uh, I think it's a good introduction of uh, what we're doing. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Alex Terrian. Uh, I'm co-founder of Future Positive Capital. Uh, it's a venture firm based in Paris. We invest out of our first fund right now across Europe uh, in the C to A stage, so half a million to about two million euros. Uh, and uh, the specificity is that we focus on companies that apply some kind of core technological or scientific breakthrough to solve a pressing challenge with a, a focus on climate, uh, climate change, environmental technologies, although not exclusively. Uh, we currently have six companies in our portfolio, uh, ranging from climate risk assessments to ecosystem restoration. We've co-invested with our friends at Ebers Ventures here lately uh, and excited to be here today. Okay, thank you. So, um, I have a short question. We heard today about uh, quantum technology and some markets are already existing, like sensing or uh, telecom. But for quantum computing, it seems that it's a long term market. But uh, some companies are raising money, like D Web, MCQ. So, my first question is uh, why quantum is so interesting for an investor? What is the promise of quantum technologies? So I think I will take this one because <laughs> we are dedicated. Although uh, we can um, just uh, enlarge the debate around deep technologies because all the, um, all the major trends and major driver of the field are roughly the same as in companies in biotechnologies or deep technologies. Uh, one thing about quantum technologies, I think, is just to note that there is not only quantum computing hardware, which is the most uh, broadcast field, but there are also quantum technologies, uh, quantum communication companies, 
and quantum sensing. And both in both fields, there are companies with uh, w which are way more mature, which are able to have already developed a commercial product. And uh, even right now, when we started Quantum Nation, there was only big players who were able to build quantum computers. But right now, we have portfolios, uh, portfolio companies like Pascal, who reached uh, one 100 qubits uh, in the lab, and uh, even more. And now, big industrials and big corporates are starting to interest in the field and help develop use cases. And one of the best examples I have is Electricité de France, who has developed a proof of concept with Pascal in order just to identify some use cases and potential applications and problems that would be accelerated with Pascal's quantum processor. So it, we are at the beginning of a, of a vast field, but we are starting now to identify very precise application with a, an economic interest. And in the end, I, I don't think that the consumer would really care about if it's quantum or not, but he just want to, to be helped in solving an issue and accelerate it and bring some economic value to it. Um, okay. But those topics also apply to, to other fields, I think, maybe. I think maybe just to complement uh, what Jean-Gabriel said, uh, I think there's also something that's happening on the market. Uh, in the past, there was uh, really a lot of different technologies and honestly, uh, very few elements to be able to say whether one technology is going to be better than the other. Uh, so on that front, I think that there's uh, now a handful of technologies uh, that have been identified and where I think we can safely say that the winner is going to be one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, let's say, the number of potential technologies uh, has been dramatically reduced. Uh, the other element is potentially the maturity of, uh, of let's say, the customer or uh, the corporate, mm -hmm. where, as Jean-Gabriel said, we know the uh, use cases emerging, and it's also about the maturity of those players, which clearly uh, start to get interested in the potential of the technology mm -hmm. and makes it attractive because there's a potential market. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting point. And I want to ask another question. What makes a quantum project interesting? Is it the potential market, the technology, the team, a mix of all that. So interesting from from a VC perspective. From a VC perspective, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you need all the components uh, in that space. Quantum is no different from other deep tech projects. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that is maybe, uh, I don't know if it's is, if it's more difficult for quantum, uh, but I think the path to move from lab to market or um, to a real business is something that is especially challenging for uh, those startups because you can't run your quantum computer in your garage. Mm -hmm. So they usually have deep ties to the, the lab and moving out of the lab could, could be a challenge in some cases. Well, I think that's a very good point that uh, Alexandre mentioned is that he finances scientific breakthroughs and they can be quantum based, but we also invest in deep physics, what mm -hmm. we call, and meaning that there is, I think we all share the, the opinion that now most of the innovation lies in our research labs. And we need intermediaries, so platforms such as VCs that are able to, s able to spin off this kind of tech. And so that's why we all look at the same thing at the beginning of a project. It's rocket science, very good, very good potential application, and the will of the team to create very interesting product. And that's what we help them structure and do that, don't you think? Maybe to provide a bit more of a controversial perspective. <laughs> I to obviously agree on, on you know, some of the parallels with, uh, with some of the other you know, advanced tech or deeper tech uh, industries. Um, uh, we're certainly seeing a lot of activity, you know, uh, the, the UK Accenture is projecting a 5x increase in the next few years from corporates uh, in quantum. Uh, just from 2020 to 2019, we've doubled the amount of investment worldwide 
into quantum companies. We're close to $500 million now invested just in 2020 already. Um, so there's definitely a lot of activity happening. Uh, at the same time, it kind of feels to me like everyone's waiting for Godot, you know, <laughs> where there's still a lot of headway that needs to be made on the pure hardware play in order to get uh, really meaningful, commercial, scalable applications. Um, and, uh, and that poses, and, and, and on top of that, you know, the, the exit landscape is, to date at least, fairly mitigated because uh, the larger players who would typically acquire companies as the market matures are developing their entire stack uh, on their own. Uh, for, and, and they haven't made that many acquisitions. And please challenge me on this if you have a different view, but that's kind of wh where I'm coming at it from. All this to say that it, 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 it feels like in order to, for a quantum project to be attractive to uh, a venture investor, you could make you know, a couple bets here and there with a small part of your fund if you want to you know, dip your toes in the space. But I think for it to be more meaningful, you want to avoid what happened with like the clean tech wave you know, 15 years ago or so. Uh, which means that companies have to find a real way to execute in the market. And if that can't be through, you know, uh, 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 revenue generating activities, and we've seen a couple of examples today of companies that are actively pursuing those, uh, nonetheless, they have to seek ways to uh, uh, demonstrate execution uh, uh, in a way that, you know, creates value. Maybe uh, through partnerships. I think this is one of the few spaces where collaboration will really matter uh, versus competition. Uh, maybe through pedagogical approaches where they're really educating the end client to use uh, quantum. And we've seen, again, a couple of examples of companies that are doing that today. Um, but I still think there's a step between that and then building, you know, what we would think of as like fund returner businesses or, you know, multi-billion dollar businesses. And at least we've not invested so far in the space. We're very curious about it, very interested in it. Uh, but I think it's because we're seeing some, some structural challenges still with the market. But please challenge me if you have a different view. <laughs> I think it, it's not challenging, it's just uh, uh, opening a bit the debate uh, because when we think uh, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communication, we very often think about the uh, uh, a vertically integrated solution. But beyond that, there's a whole ecosystem of technological bricks that are actually in some cases transverse and can be used for one technology or another one. And so... Um, I think that for the moment, uh, in terms of exits, apart for some kind of more mature uh, project where uh, I would say there, there's an interesting trajectory already there, uh, the other uh, deals where there's, there's something that could be interesting are those key technological bricks that could be played by VC instead of playing the, the entire stack, which I mean, obviously, it's kind of a, a, a longer-term uh, play. Well, I, I totally agree with you, Mathieu, on, on some parts. Thank you. you Alexandre. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I believe that there is some uh, filière, as we say in France, with specific technologies who are all reaching the same long-term long goal. But in the end, many of them have some application in the near term, and in the short-term space, that will be very interesting on the path towards the famous uh, universal quantum computer. And this kind of research and this kind of commercial development will only be achieved if there is a vision behind that. And that's a very fruitful race between all these companies because at some point we'll, each we'll hit some very interesting milestone and we'll also be able to perform some other application and create some markets which will fit in some specific market needs and, and I believe that there is a space in the defense, in the aerospace industry for that kind of application in the, in the quantum sen sensing part. And we, we did not have discovered it yet, but that's a very interesting road to, to, to pursue and, and that is the thing with quantum technologies. It's that it's a long-term goal, which is in fact a very good thing, on my point of view. Okay, that's a good thing that we consider the a long term. But uh, is there a risk to create some kind of bubble if there is huge investment in quantum, but years after year there will be no product or no no result? 
he happened such an effect in the year 2000 with the telecom and internet bubble that just collapsed in a, in very, in a few days. So what is your view on that, on the possibility to create some bubble on the quantum technology? Uh, just a quick answer. Um, well, the short story that we are not at the point where we could be compared to the telecom bubble in terms of <laughs> money invested, in terms of number of company. Okay. So if, is it, if it happened, it will be like in roughly 10 or 20 years. Um, on the other side, Quantum has theoretically demonstrated moonshot applications. And those applications could lead to very high valuation. But in the end, uh, if a company is able to achieve these goals, those valuations would not be tremendous. And if you are able to fight climate change, well, you'll be worth billions, and that would not be shocking. And, and this company would be able to make those kind of money. And that's why huge companies such as Google are seeking that goal. And the road is going to be long, and it's going to be hard toward that very long-term goal. But Blooming valuations can be sustainable because we know that this long-term goal will be very, very interesting in terms of market and application. But yeah, that's always the same story. And some company will raise a lot of money on a high valuation, and they will not be able to 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 to, to execute their vision. But that's like I think it will be a sporadic issue on selected company, but not a whole failure. Okay. Yeah, I would say that the comparison with 2000 is not accurate in this case. Uh, there was a huge decorrelation between any kind of fundamental business uh, reality and uh, valuation of businesses. The world has changed in the last 20 years, and we're in a world where there's fundamental technological value uh, that sits at the core of a lot of those quantum companies, as with other advanced tech projects. And uh, even before any kind of commercial demonstration, that value holds uh, inherent value, which uh, uh, in theory should be exited uh, uh, or should have pathways to, to exit that are uh, meaningfully correlated to that value. So I think we're very far from the world of, uh, of 2000. Um, but that's why I think the comparison to the clean tech wave is actually interesting because that also is the case to some extent. And, and, and so that's why I'm, I'm really curious to see how the M&A market develops here and, and whether there are you know, uh, uh, real exit ramps for investors uh, in this space within, of course, meaningful time frames. I mean, without talking about uh, uh, bubble, I think we can we can say there's some kind of hype around quantum. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would I I mean I th I share your view about like the potential, the long-term potential, and so uh, elevated valuation makes sense in that context. However. Uh, my feeling is that on the short term, a lot of the valuations have been built on uh, subsidies, governmental uh, uh, purchase, European purchases, mm. things like that. A and so what is going to be key for that industry and that filière, as you say, is to be able to grow in a way where basically uh, they will find their market at the right moment. Mm. So if they build a cost structure yeah. too quickly to align with those uh, public funding and those public funding disappear, they will end up with high costs, high cash burns, no real market yet. And that's where I feel that they have to be extremely cautious in the way they grow and use the money they can get from governments, from the flagship projects and things like that on the short term to make sure that they won't face a gap later on. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to add a, comp uh, a complimentary um, remark on what you said, is that we should not forget that all of these companies are spin-off from laboratories, and they are building a company out of technology that has been financed in more than 20 years by public money, and all these technologies are in most cases, and what is VC are seeking to be exclusive to the company through know-how or special collaboration. And that's why you can have high valuation because 
uh, just try to rebuild that from scratch, you'll have to pump millions of euros in order to do the same thing. And, and you see valuations that are milestone in VCs comparable to what digital has done. And the m order of magnitude are roughly the same. But in fact, the value of the company can be really well, can be really um, different from what we see in digital and what Alexandre said, that there is this inherent value in deep tech and especially quantum technology that can drive valuation higher. But that's not uh, uh, an advice because we don't think that you should go for the highest valuation and that can be really dangerous for the company in its development to be valued too high too soon. But that must be compared um, with uh, uh, intelligence to digital, to what digital is, uh, era has, to, has done. Okay. Um, so we have seen today that quantum uh, is a lot of hardware with very complex technology, cryogenic technology, and so on. But it's also if you think about the quantum ecosystem, it's a mix of the two. And uh, yeah. one doesn't make sense with without the other. Yeah. I think it's also a question of momentum, as you said. Uh, right now, the market um, can create a lot of value in the hardware space, but maybe in 10, 20 years, uh, we don't see how we can be able to create the same amount of value as we did in the classic computing space. And so, That can be right time for hardware investment, also software. But what we've seen on uh, our side is that software is more native for VCs to invest in. So they try to compare quantum software to classic software, which is really, really complete, completely different. And, and that's a fact. So software companies, quantum software companies, can get um, money easily because they benefit from the understanding of the software space in classic space. So from my point of view, it's really a question of momentum. And at Quantum Nation, we believe that also in the quantum software base, space, you need to have subject matter experts, because right now you are answering an industrial need, which is very complex. And you need to have people developing the software to fully understand what the customer is waiting for. Uh, and that's the kind of thing w you can see generalist uh, quantum software companies such as QCWare, which are, f which are trying to reach all the verticals. And I think it's uh, pretty hard. And you need to raise, well, what QCWare did, raise a lot of money in order to address all those verticals. But you can be challenged application is in the specific industry. Okay. I think we will conclude. This, uh, this round table, so thank you, all of you, and uh, you will also hand the seminar today. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, you. thank you. So, please, uh, video. I have the mic. Uh, I hope it works. Um, and I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to thank you guys for participating in this event. I would like to thank all the speakers in general. It was a great event. It was great to see you here in this nice place. Also, special thank to the, all, uh, all the team. Uh, I would like to mention all the people, technical people here behind the camera. So Benjamin, um, Quentin, thank you very much. Also, also would like to thank Nadia, uh, Manon for the organization, Manu, uh, Mathieu and Louise, who could not be here because it's her birthday. So happy birthday, Louise. And I hope to see you in the next event from La French Tech Paris Saclay with maybe Le Lab Quantique or maybe <laughs> other partners. So thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>